everyone. This is Chao Wen recording in、um, May 2023. After finishing the first season of the Conductors Podcast, I have decided to give this podcast project a dedicated website with more user-friendly functions. So now we have a brand new website called theconductorspodcast.com. Straightforward, right? And now we also have its own、um, Instagram handle. It's also the same, the Conductors Podcast. Um, so、um, all the show notes have been moved to the new site, and I invite you to come check out all the resources. And happy listening! If you are going to a workshop that has teachers involved, be teachable and kind of leave your ego at the door. So that means you have to psychologically prepare yourself that you are going to get. What appears like criticism, but we try not to do it as criticisms. We try to do it as helpful comments. <laughs> but our goal is always to make you a better conductor. Hello, hello! Welcome back to episode number sixty of the Conductors Podcast. I'm your host Chao Wen Tian. I'm so thrilled to welcome you back to this week's episode. And happy birthday to the podcast! A year ago, in October 2021, I launched this project. It started as a passion project, and I wanted to thank everyone for helping me and also for listening to me talking and also my conversations with a lot of great colleagues during this journey. I can't say thank you enough. I'm I'm so excited because my guest today is a very very special and awesome conductor, Diane Wheatley, named nationally as one of the top thirty professional musicians, is a renowned conductor and also the music director of the Allenton Symphony in Pennsylvania and also the Garden State Philharmonic in New Jersey. She is the author of the two books. Beyond the Baton and Baton Basics: Communicating Music Through Gestures. And today, in our conversation, we are going to talk about her experience teaching and coaching young conductors through workshops, through master classes, and she also taught some courses in different universities, institutions. And she will share some common challenges that she's seen a lot among young conductors. And also give suggestions on how to overcome some of the not barriers, but but kind of think about some of the problems in a different way. And when I first contacted her, I'm asking what she wanted to talk about, and she immediately say she wanted to talk about conducting techniques and also how to understand using gestures to communicate sound quality, texture, energy, and emotion. Through your gestures, this is a great conversation, and we covered a lot of things. So I won't say any more because it's a great, great, great one. I wanted you to listen to it. So let's dive in. Good morning, Diane. I'm so thrilled and so excited to welcome you to the Conductors Podcast. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I always ask this question to my guests before we get started. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you started, and how you get to where you are right now? Yeah, so I'm currently the music director and conductor of the Allentown Symphony in Pennsylvania, and that's a professional orchestra that does about 28 performances a year. And then also the music director and conductor of the Garden State Philharmonic, which is an orchestra that plays down at the Jersey Shore and uses mostly New York professional musicians. And then many people know me as the author of Beyond the Baton, a book about artistic leadership for orchestra conductors. And then I also wrote a book called Baton Basics. And then because of of my work with these books and sort of my passion for teaching, I tend to teach a lot of conducting workshops. So I'm actually teaching four different ones this year. I just finished doing the one in the Czech Republic through the International Conductors Institute. Did the Northwest Pacific Conducting Institute on Whidbey Island, which is a beautiful place to spend a week.、Uh, we'll be doing the Denver Philharmonic International Conducting Workshop in February, and then also working a little bit with the Atlantic Coast International Conducting Academy, and that will be in December. 
So I'm passionate about both conducting and teaching. This is fabulous. So some of the, I know like we conductors learn from doing things and making mistakes. How did you find the balance between teaching and conducting professionally, like manage schedules and all those things? I'm so amazed. Yeah, it, I think it happened really quite organically. I wrote the Beyond the Baton book in 2007, actually because I felt there was a great need in the field for knowledge about the conductor's job off the podium. And I remember that I sat with the executive director of the Norwalk Symphony, where I was the conductor then, and we sort of brainstormed this conducting workshop to spread the knowledge. And, you know, at first we thought, well, maybe people would just come from a couple hours drive. And we were, we were thinking of kind of a very small thing. And then we were totally shocked when we had applicants that from all over the country and eventually from all over the world that wanted to attend. That's how the teaching sort of started. And at the beginning, it was, it was a little bit more talking more about the administrative side of the conductor's job. And then eventually morphed, particularly as I, I wrote the second book, Baton Basics, really morphed more into the conducting technique. I think a lot of people don't realize there are so many things and factors beyond actually waving your arms as a conductor. And this is what this podcast is about, partly as well. So we can learn all the, like you say, administrative side. But as you mentioned, before we get to that stage when you can actually manage people or use your administrative skills, you have to be a good conductor with your hands first. In teaching, what are some most important skills that you want your students to develop? I was one of those conductors who I had a lot of great musical ideas, but I found I sometimes had trouble getting those back from the orchestra. And as you begin to analyze, it's always something that you're doing probably subconsciously that's getting in the way of the communication. So I had to really spend some time understanding the different types of conducting gestures and beats. So, you know, some beats are what we call ictus based. And, and so a conductor has to understand this and has to be able to utilize the right type of beat for the right type of music. So an ictus based is sort of the first type of conducting stroke you learn in the United States. And with that, the impact happens at the end of the stroke always. But we also have the pendulum type of beat where the impact and the note actually happens in the middle of the stroke, sort of like if you're hitting a tennis ball, you hit the ball, but the stroke continues. So there's a momentum into it, there's the sounding of the note, and then there's, there's sort of a release of the energy. And then the third one that you have to incorporate is, is the sense of weight, which comes more from the, the Moosin technique, which is a Russian technique, which really deals with carrying or holding a weight in your hand and the weight never releases. And so their gesture is based more on, on a sort of a circle concept where the sound happens at seven o'clock, not at the bottom, but a little bit after that. And so it's understanding the different types of gestures that, that I hope, you know, conductors really spend some time on and also understanding energy is the stroke energy towards which creates a certain type of sound or is it energy away? On top of that, you have to also incorporate speed. So I tell conductors, you know, you have to be able to say everything with your hands and having the technique to do that and understanding what technique is correct for the type of sound you want at that moment is going to really help you communicate the music. This is fabulous. I'm taking notes myself <laughs> and I love like th this is how I feel like every time I talk to you I'm like taking a lot of notes because you just say such great things do you feel the pendulum type of beat is something that you would use when you work with a European particular orchestra which plays really behind the beat you can use it for that so the pendulum stroke is best used for lyrical things when you want to have the ability to move things forward so if you're doing an accelerando and you're trying to use an ictus beat, it's never going to work because they cannot judge the next beat from the rebound. You actually release them during the rebound. But with a pendulum stroke, I can set up tempo changes. I wouldn't say necessarily that you would use 
a certain beat all the time. So it wouldn't be that in Europe, I'm going to use pendulum stroke only. I'm going to use the, the stroke that actually works best for communicating the music. So I compare it to violin bowing or any string bowing. If we were to only use a, a marcato stroke in the upper part of the bow, which is sort of the beginning stroke that a beginner learns, that's kind of the level of some people's conducting technique when they start out and understanding that you can't just use that one singular technique. So maybe they can do it staccato and legato, but it's still basically a martelet stroke. And I'm saying we need to develop the muscle memory in our hands so that we can actually, like a violinist would show, off the string playing. But there's many different types of off the string playing. Same for conducting. You know, a simple example, and, and this also deals with energy towards in a way, is if you have an ictus stroke, and maybe you're doing a very small ictus stroke, like, and I call it the water droplet stroke. So everything is related to something you know and understand. You know, the word ictus to somebody in a foreign country means nothing. But if I say you have a water droplet at the end of your baton and you're going to shake it off, they all understand that. And that gets a certain sound, and that is energy towards the beat, right? The energy is down to shake the water droplet off. That will get a certain sound. So if you do that gesture and you hear in your head what that sound would be, compared with what I call touching a hot stove. So if I touch a hot stove, the energy is away from the moment that the beat is happening. Okay? So it's two different gestures that will get two totally different sounds. And so... Within each of these types of overall gestures, so an ictus type of beat where it's happening at the end of the stroke, a pendulum, or the weight stroke, within there, there are all different types of ways you can experiment with communicating to get different types of sound. With the Baton Basics book, I just sort of creatively brainstormed a whole lot of gestures and then sort of categorized them so that we could train the fingers and how those work separately from the wrist and then the forearm and the full arm, and then how to begin to apply when to use what, just like you would if you were a violinist and you were learning bowing technique. This is fabulous. What I was amazed the most when I read your book was how you, as you say, like compare those conducting gestures with some daily motions that it's easily relatable and easily understood. That's, that's really amazing. I wanted to ask a, probably like a little different questions because I know from my own experience when I was starting and also I heard it from a lot of students asking when they are conducting, they are just so overwhelmed with the sound and there are so many things to worry. And it's like I told them not to worry, but they, they are thinking about their gesture, thinking about the sound. They don't know where to direct their attention to. Like for students like that, how do you help them? This is an excellent question. So first off, I would say just like a violinist practices exercise separately from their concerto repertoire to train muscle memory, I would work in 15 to 20 minutes of exercises training the muscles, okay? Because then when you're in the moment, you don't have to think. You should never have to think about the technique. It should be spontaneous. Just like a violinist, they see a passage with a slur and dots over it, and they know, okay, that's going to be my up bow staccato. They just know that that's the gesture you have to use to get that sound. You want to, when you're on the podium, you want to free yourself up to really be able to listen, as you know, because that's the most important thing. And it does take time because the sound does appear often when you're on the podium for the first few times to be behind where your gestures are, which is necessary, actually. No matter what, there is always going to be a very, very slight delay because you are leading. So when you have a forte, if you are actually conducting the forte when it is being played by the orchestra, it's already too late. Everything you do as a conductor has to prep that moment. So I'm going to be showing my forte either an eighth note ahead of time or a quarter note ahead of when they're going to play it. And so this feeling of actually anticipation is something that takes a little bit of getting used to. But if you can practice mentally ahead of time, really understanding 
that you're not playing the note with them. It's not your job to smash down on that downbeat of the forte. It's your job to prep them and then let them go. So a lot of it is psychological. When I teach, I ask conductors to actually create wherever they're practicing a podium space. Sometimes they even like put tape on the ground and and where they have their, and to imagine the orchestra so that when they get in the situation, they've already sort of psychologically gotten over that barrier. So they can see where the instruments are. They know where the cues are. They sort of practice where those cues might happen. So they've developed some muscle memory. And I think that that helps when they get in front of the orchestra to take that out of the equation of the factors of things that they're worried about. So it's sort of breaking down and preparing yourself ahead of time as much as you can. I think that's like a totally great thing that you said. I know with, there is always this debate whether conducting can be taught, but I think we all agree that you can have better techniques or like better tools to use to convey your ideas. But different from an instrumentalist or even a vocalist, when they practice, they can actually hear the sound that they are making. When we practice the motion isolated from the ensemble, then there's this dilemma because when you're working with the ensemble, you don't want to be just practicing for yourself. You want, don't want to waste the musician's time. So how can you incorporate that part of the audio, the part that where you're hearing the sounds like, or even revoking different reaction from your practice? I'm glad you asked this question because so often I find people practice by singing. And this is actually, I don't feel a good idea. And I'll tell you why. When you sing, it's coming from a different part. And it's actually being controlled by your head and not your hand. And your hand is actually reacting. So the energy is actually going backwards. So what I prefer is to have people really study the score so they really know it and they can hear the score in their head. Okay? So they can hear the different parts. They can hear it. And maybe you have to work in very small chunks so that you say, okay, I I know how this part goes. And then I say, conduct it. But as you conduct it, look at your hand, feel your hand, and hear in your head the sound that your hand is actually creating. So as, as you're preparing, you're and, and experiment. So do a passage and say, okay, I'm going to conduct it this way with this type of gesture and hear what that sounds like in your head and then conduct it with a different type of articulation or a different using a different gesture and hear what you think that would sound like because you can respond to your own hand and it changes the direction of of what's leading and i find that once a conductor understands this it is absolutely revolutionary in the way that they approach how they prepare another thing they can do is to actually take a section and videotape themselves conducting it silently and then watch the tape with their instrument in their hands and see if if you are actually communicating what you thought you were communicating. I find that there's a lot of people who beat time. And as, as we all know, really great musicians have no need of someone who beats time on the podium. So the question is, what are you going to communicate about the articulation the character, the density of the sound, that's what you need to communicate as a conductor, not here's where you come in and this is a four bar. But that's a lot of people's first conducting lessons. You learn conducting from the beat pattern and then you learn crescendo, decrescendo, and cueing. So do you feel that we should actually teach conducting kind of from the other way around instead of teaching all the big patterns to start with? I do. And actually in my Baton Basics book, which is, even though it's called Basics, I wrote it for advanced conductors because I was working with so many people who needed help with technique. I start there in the preface saying, wouldn't it be great if we could start from a different place? You know, wouldn't we, it'd be great if we could talk about this gesture creates this sort of sound. And so often if I'm teaching with a group of conductors, we'll divide into pairs. And I use a lot of objects so that you can actually pick up different objects and feel the weight of them in your hands and think about what type of sound might be related to that weight. And then can they communicate 
that weight to someone else? And can that other person guess what the object was that they were trying to hold? You know, so was it a ball of cotton? Was it a bottle of water? Was it an orange? But not dealing with the exact object, dealing with the weight and density of that object. Because then you could easily put that into a beat pattern, but it's not being obsessed with the beat patterns. The beat patterns are basically one or two dimensional. And, and it's like the difference between a map of the world and the actual world. <laughs> You know, and so often we're we're in this very, very limited scope. And what we're really trying to communicate is music and sound and joy and what type of articulation, you know, the difference between a hot stove and an ictus, you know, what is that sound? It's subtle. It's so subtle. But once you actually begin to experiment with broadening your concept of what gestures you can incorporate, it is so much more fun as a musician because you can get so much more nuance from your ensemble. And I love what you said about not to practice conducting while singing, because I found some conducting students, they are so used to singing, and they will be singing to the ensemble, and they are not actually listening. They're just conducting the music in their head. Exactly, exactly. And I think, so when you hear it in your head, and you're hearing it where the brain is not leading, the hand is leading. So I'm hearing... And so we practice that. We practice hearing what our hand is doing and doing different types of things and seeing if we can hear what the hand is doing every single time. And that gives us the ability then to do that when we're on the podium. And I just wanted to emphasize what you just said. It's really important to understand the perspective of how other people will perceive it. And one great way is to record yourself conducting silent and see if you can figure out what you were conveying right <laughs> and also get a partner that's the best it can be embarrassing to start with i hate watching myself but that is that's a brutal thing that you have to get through as a conductor it's so true it's so true and you need that support system you know if you're out there form a little club of conductors in your area and get together and and kind of watch and critique each other because you need colleagues that you can honestly go to for feedback. I think it's very, very important in the development and, and you'll make so much more progress. That's why I love teaching in that group situation because more people can watch different conductors maybe struggling with the same issues and see how they are, are mastering different types of technique and what is working for them. I think people learn much quicker that way. Absolutely. But for conductors facing so many different workshops, master classes, now we have more and more with COVID restrictions lifting. How do you feel that a student should choose or how do they choose which one would be the best for them? And sometimes when you are guest teaching or co-teaching with someone, the students might be getting conflicting information or like seemingly conflicting information. How do you suggest that they deal with those kind of situations? So it's really two questions. How do you choose where you're going to go? And then with multiple teachers, how do you kind of navigate that situation? Yes. So choosing, I always say, you know, go with the best teacher in the best orchestra, if you can, because then you're going to get hopefully the best training. You know, sometimes people will be, go, oh, they have a competition and I might get to get to conduct. And, you know, those things are already are great. But honestly, you want to develop your conducting to be the best you can be. And so I think it's really important to study with someone that you respect and that you think is going to move you forward. Okay. Then, you know, as a, as a teacher, I do co-teach with other teachers and it's, it's the same thing. I think we're always trying to be very sensitive to what the other teacher is saying that so we don't put students in that position where one teacher is telling them one thing and then they're in another room and the other teacher is telling them something totally different. But I also have to say that just like there's no singular technique, you don't use a pendulum beat pattern for everything. You don't use you know, the Moosin technique for everything. Often when it sounds like a teacher is conflicting, it has to do with specifically the music in that very specific spot and what a solution 
might be for the problem you're having in that moment, in that spot. And once again, there's many different ways to navigate a particular spot. So I can choose to use a pendulum beat. I can choose to use more of a moosen beat. I have to decide. And so I say try both. You know, listen to everything that you're taught at a workshop because the people teaching have many years of experience and they've struggled with it themselves. So they're, they're coming to you hopefully in the right spirit to help you through through an issue. And then after you leave the workshop, you'll be able to have it sort of simmer like, you know, good spaghetti sauce. And you'll figure out what works best for you. I remember as a student, I would ping pong. You know, I'd work with one teacher and then I would overdo everything they said. And then it would be too much. So then I'd go to another teacher who would say, oh no, you're, you know, and then I would go ping pong the other direction. And it took me a long time to figure out that Everyone was right, but I had to be wise in understanding where to apply their suggestions and technique. So as you said, in an ideal world, of course, we'll go to the workshop with the best teachers, with the best ensemble and the most affordable and somewhere that is close to <laughs> close to where you are. But sometimes we can't really make those happen. So let's like say a, a good, famous conductor, teacher, teaching with a string quartet or two pianos versus an unknown or some teacher with a lot of podium time where you can really try out repertoire. How would you like kind of weigh and compare those kind of workshops if you Yeah, you have and to? they're both, I mean, they both bring different things. So if you're a conductor that's applying for a lot of jobs and you need a really good video, then you got to go with the big orchestra the orchestra is large enough to do big rep that you can really get a good video. So that's one goal that needs to be accomplished. If you're a, a conductor that has an orchestra, you've got quite a bit of podium time and you really want to fine tune your technique. I think working with a string quartet is great. I don't recommend two pianos because you don't get back enough variety of the gesture in the sound back. They cannot do the nuance, and so you can't really tell whether your gesture is being effective. But I think with string quartet and piano, that can definitely be accomplished. And many workshops, you know, the ones I'm teaching are incorporating some days of string quartet and piano before the orchestra rehearsal so that we're able to not waste the time on the podium with the orchestra. We're able to work all those technical things out in a much, what I call, smaller, safer environment, you know, where we can really, you know, work on things, do it again and again and again, and with a supportive quartet. And then with that situation, then we can let you go more with the orchestra where you can experiment, but where, as a teacher, you know, we're not always interrupting. That is really wise, and it's sad, and I don't know, I sometimes felt that it was really sad that now we really need good videos with great ensembles that they can play standard rep because I remember when I first started out, I would just grab a couple of friends, play something for my audition tape, and it wasn't even required to have a tape back then. Yeah. But now with students getting more and more experienced, so I wanted to get your opinion um, on a particular fellow that I worked with through Girls Who Conduct. So she is an undergrad student and she's, I think she has some experience conducting ensembles she organizes her own orchestras but because she is not constantly conducting so she would take something with her from one workshop to try it out at another workshop maybe three months later sometimes she overcompensate things like she was told that she was not having enough weight and then she would be very macho for the next one or things change like when it, like, as I say a teacher tells you something might be only applicable for that particular musical moment. So like I'm seeing her, I've mentored her for about a year now. I'm seeing her performance like kind of going up and down just because she's not getting constant teaching and also like experience. I think that's what most of people when they are just starting out, you don't have an ensemble every week. What would you say to those kind of conductors on how to continue improving themselves? Yeah, and that's it's happening more and more. So most people, when you're in a graduate program, you're getting that constant teaching. 
And more and more, I am seeing that conductors are bouncing from one workshop to the next work and all with different people. And they, they are getting a lot of knowledge. But as you say, in the end, I'm not sure they're actually moving forward, tending to sometimes over overdo and and not actually move forward. And right now in the United States, it's, it's an interesting challenge and maybe, maybe something you and I should address or some other conductors should address is some sort of ongoing academy where people could study for a full year with the same person. And maybe it's not every week, but some sort of extension of a workshop experience so that people could have that ability to before they overdo in a direction and develop really bad habits to get these sort of checkups ongoing wise. Because when we think about it, there is no other field like in music. All other instruments start when they're very young. They have ongoing continuous training for multiple years. A violinist might start at age five. By the time they get to college, they've had 15 years of training in conducting, there is no undergraduate program in the United States, only graduate programs where you can actually have an orchestra to work with regularly. So you have two years of training and then you're put out as a full-time you know, conductor. And that's just ridiculous, right? <laughs> you know, we need more opportunities for long-term ongoing training and whether that's an artist diploma with more years or whether it's a combination of online and uh, workshop setting. I don't know the answer, but there's a void in the United States, at least, for this type of pro training. Now, I just met with someone in Vienna, and they are starting a program there that, that's like uh, an extension artist degree program that's a few years that you take where you come together like once a month, and it is an ongoing continuous study so you can work with the same teachers for, you know, two more years. And that might be something that is necessary in the United States, not for the degree, but simply for the training so that we can actually be the best that we can be at our jobs. I certainly feel you. And so I got a question just last week. Someone sent me a message on social media asking, I think she just did the conductor's retreat with Ken Kistler and really liked conducting. She was less experienced as I understood. And she was wondering if she should go into a graduate program or just continue working and do workshops. I think this is like a similar dilemma because we don't have this support system like some of other countries or even schools that a lot of people are jumping between programs and workshops based on what you can find time and money for. But it's just a little sad that you're not having a trajectory in a sense. Yeah, and part of it is that right now, because sort of the door is open, there are so many people that are interested in conducting and there's not enough places for them in all the graduate programs across the country. And then it gets even more difficult to get that doctorate in conducting. I know people are actually choosing the route of, well, I'll just do a lot of conducting workshops as my training, which is great because you can actually, for probably almost the same amount of money, you know, get the same amount of, of podium time. The thing that's really lacking is a long-term mentor and someone that's actually working with you over a longer period of time to make sure you're not developing bad habits. So coming back to a little different question or like from um, the other side, since you've been teaching so many different programs and seeing a lot of students in different settings, are there some common challenges that you see all the time or like that's shared among many students that you wanted to address a little bit? Yeah, I do have some challenges. So some of the things that I see pretty regularly that people can work on before they go to a workshop is, you know, one very basic thing is pacing on the podium, not being grounded. And this is usually caused by people not wanting the podium very close to them. And so what they do is they step forward to turn the page and then they step back because they feel like they need more space. And so, you know, that's why I say define your conducting space, practice with your podium close enough that you can turn the pages without moving your feet. And then I also have people jump up and down 
and get, uh, that's me. <laughs> yeah, get grounded so that you when you jump up and down and then you stop, your feet usually tend to land in a nice position that works for your body, and you feel the grounding of your body. I don't feel that you can actually pull the music through you and have the power unless you're grounded. There are people that have different philosophies on this, but I'm very much a keep the body still and focused and grounded. The other thing I see people conducting with a lot of tension and the wrong muscles. And this usually happens when they're trying to show forte. And it's because they're only using size and speed to show forte. And so it's because they've taken that diagram in, in the one dimensional book and they've just made it larger and therefore you have to move faster. But there are so many other ways to show forte with weight and with density. And so that's another thing that people need to work on. And, and so I, I often say, you know, lift heavy things get accustomed to, to actually with Forte slowing the beat down and making actually a smaller beat to show Forte and staying in the sound as opposed to these fast beats that sort of become flashing beats. And then the biggest problem I find is when people conducting time instead of music. And so really thinking, what do you want to say musically and understanding that maybe you could leave out some beats. You don't have to conduct all those beats all the time. Let the orchestra go a little bit, I think is important. And then on the other side, I think there's some psychological challenges. When people go to a workshop, they tend to spend a lot of time comparing themselves to others. This is not a good idea. <laughs> you know, I always compare it to you, you are who you are. And it doesn't do any good to to waste energy wishing to be someone else. You will get to where that other person is in your own time. But focus on yourself and really applaud yourself for your, your mini victories as you work through the workshop. Some people have difficulty changing quickly and they get very frustrated at a workshop. So you have to kind of, once again, cut yourself some slack. As teachers, we don't expect you to be able to change quickly. So we're not upset or anything. We understand that sometimes that aha moment happens six months later. We don't expect you. We're pleased if you can change quickly, but we understand that it takes time to process and to retrain muscles. Most importantly, retraining muscles that have done a certain thing for years sometimes that we're suggesting that you do the muscles differently, takes a lot of focus. And then some people have a challenge of that they get very self-conscious and have difficulty with someone telling them to change in front of the whole orchestra. And, and we totally understand that as teachers, and, and we try to be really sensitive to that, to that. But you psychologically, when you go to a workshop, need to really mentally prepare yourself for the fact that you won't be perfect. You are there actually, hopefully you want to learn. Most of us are not interested in people there just to show off or just to get a video. If we notice that that's the only reason you're there, we will actually start teaching you differently and we won't give you all the information because if you're not interested, we're not gonna waste our time and your time. But that's not good for you because that means we're also probably not gonna recommend you for a job because you're a person that thinks they already know everything. And so if you are going to a workshop that has teachers involved, be teachable and kind of leave your ego at the door. So that means you have to psychologically prepare yourself that you are going to get what appears like criticism, but we try not to do it as criticisms. We try to do it as helpful comments. <laughs> but our goal is always to make you a better conductor and that's part of going to a workshop. But those are psychological challenges that you do want to really think about in advance. And I remember my early workshops where I was psychologically not prepared. I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really understand that I would have to change in front of 80 people on the podium and do something different and be uncomfortable. And so it's something you need to think about ahead of time and embrace that as 
a great learning opportunity. And know that the orchestra is with you also, except for in a few Eastern European countries, sometimes if they don't understand how workshops work, sometimes they're not as supportive. But if you're with an orchestra that has done a lot of playing for workshops, they're supportive of you too. They want you to be successful because it makes their job so much easier. I was laughing because I had a opposite experience at one of the workshops many years ago that I attended. It's a workshop known for not having a teacher, so you get feedback from the orchestra. So I thought that's a great opportunity that I'm going to try different things and see what works and what doesn't work. That was a a great thing to do. So I remember I were winning and the repertoire was aerobic up. So I was trying different things at the very beginning, trying how I can set tempo differently, how to fill a pulse. And then someone stopped me, gave me a look that I didn't know what I was doing. And I was eliminated from the program after that day. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> because apparently they were looking for a competent conduct. Like I was, I felt it because I saw other conductors all like taking the shortcut. So they start from the middle or from the coda and then did the repeat. So they didn't, they avoided the opening challenge. So you already set the tempo, everything was good. So like you repeat and then when you go to the beginning, it was great. And I thought, why, why are you coming to a workshop and just look great? I wanted to experiment things, <laughs> but I misunderstood. That was probably a mismatch. <laughs> yes, yes. And that, and that happens. The other thing was, if you're asking the string quartet with just four people, I think you can get sort of a, a uniform opinion back. But when you've got a full orchestra, as you know, the brass people have different needs and different things that they're looking for than the string players. And, and so you can probably get pretty confused pretty quickly with all the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like looking back, I, I thought it was great because like the orchestra was playing voluntarily. So we only pay a little money. And ah, okay. yeah, yeah. Some of them were more willing to teach. But as you say, they have very different perspectives. And then sometimes I, what I found is... Orchestra members very often understand the problems, but they don't always have the best solutions. They will tell you what they think you should be doing instead, but it's not always the right thing to do. This right. Time. And knowing how to solve it. So this is why conducting technique is so important is because usually when there's a problem and they don't actually know, but they, you're giving, you're using the wrong type of beat. So maybe you're using an ictus beat when you should be using a rubber band beat. You know, the rubber band beat is, I was never taught this, but it's where you pretend that there's a rubber band connected to both sides and you're pulling both ways. And that stays in the moment more and allows people to play a different type of articulation. But if the person doesn't know the solution, it doesn't help you very much. Because <laughs> you're already doing what you thought would work. And so you need the, the quick advice of what would work, what type of gesture would work better. Yeah. So here's the dilemma because I've taught workshops where the conductor told me they don't want to be interrupted. They want to try things out and they would pretty much prefer that we talk about it after they have conducted or even watch video instead of interrupting them. Because as conductors, we know when, once you're interrupted, your thought process is not cohesive. Sometimes you forgot what you were doing and then you get so distracted trying to need, do new things or trying to pay attention and they get distracted. How would you say to those conductors to encourage them to really try? Because I felt they sometimes miss the great opportunity to really try different things and get the feedback from the sound. Yeah, and I, I agree. And, and I, we're always there to support. So if they need a video and they need a rehearsal video, you know, I always, if you, if you want to not be interrupted, that's fine. But a situation happened with me recently with someone I worked with where they were doing a piece where they were they were using the wrong stroke. So, and it was a piece that the whole movement was based upon a certain type of gesture, and their gesture was getting in the way. And I told them afterwards, I said, you know, if I could have gone up there for like three minutes and just made a suggestion on changing the gesture you were using for this, I said it would have it would have changed everything for the whole rest of your session with that orchestra, where. They wanted the video, but what they landed up with is something that they can't use because they weren't able to get the type of sound because they were using the wrong type of gesture. So we work with anything that, you know, the people that are coming to a workshop, it's for them, you know. So we will do 
But I still suggest, you know, leave that window open because sometimes we can just come up and whisper something to you. I usually try to do that when the orchestra is there is just whisper something to the conductor, make a small suggestion, then let them go again. And then I usually take notes and talk to people afterwards. I do think that the best workshops are where there are some days ahead of time to work with string quartet and piano on the repertoire where you can really address, once again, in that kind of more comfortable environment, some of the technical things and suggestions. And I'm even thinking that maybe uh, we should start incorporating a Zoom call ahead of time where we can do some of this. Because once again, you can conduct silently and you can develop technique and work on it separate from the orchestra, which might make people more successful on the podium later on. I totally agree. I think for one of our Girls Who Conduct Fellowship, we did a score study in Zoom call. So like they could ask questions to get some ideas, some, like, something even basic, do you take time here? Is it good to be in two and four? Like, what should I be looking out for? I think that mental preparation is really important. Yeah, yeah. But you say something that's so important, but rarely talked about is like your mentality when you're in workshops, because it's so hard not to compare yourself with others because you're surrounded with so many different collectors and you are being evaluated in in a way by players, by the teachers, by each other. What can you help, like some suggestions for conductors? I think not just going to workshop, but even in general in this profession, it's so easy to look at other people's success, appointments, gigs, and get really distracted or like destroyed sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, it's expectation management. And, and we all face it. I think with competitions, particularly, you know, the person that wins the competition is no better violinist the day after they won the competition than the day they were before the competition. They are exactly the same. Somebody has awarded them a prize, right? But they are the same. And the person that didn't win is also the same. So I guess psychologically, in order to keep ourselves feeling good about ourselves, we have to kind of award ourselves a prize, but we have to also accept that we are where we are. So I think going into workshops, don't go into a workshop expecting to win if there's a prize. Go into a workshop expecting to learn and expecting to build some good contacts with colleagues. So manage your expectations and understand that Conducting is a long, 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 long road. (laughs) And if you're going to do it, your goal is to learn something new every day and be joyful about that. But if you go to a competition or a workshop saying, I want to win, you're most likely going to be disappointed, right? So you really do have to manage your own expectations. And and I know that as conductors, we are all highly, highly competitive. And so I think, you know, don't spend so much time on Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Don't spend the time comparing yourself to other people. Just focus on your stair steps of what your goals are and becoming better and better. It's like the tortoise and the hare story, you know. There are some people that get there faster, but then sometimes they kind of burn out. And it's usually people that were slow and plotting and just every single day they're working on it. They're getting better. They're working on their ears and they're listening. They're working on their technique. They're growing their repertoire. I believe that they will be successful no matter what. And so you have to really believe in yourself. It's really important. Yes, I love that conducting is a profession that you can continue doing until you're 70, 80, 90, as long as your health (laughs) permits, we are still babies. And you know, the sad, I will say the sad thing about the field is in the last, I would say maybe 15, 20 years, it used to be that the field really, you had to be like an old European person to be conducting the United States. That was the model. And now a lot of the orchestras are promoting people very, very young and inexperienced to very large jobs, which is not necessarily good for them or for the field because 
they haven't been through all the repertoire. And so that is the model. So it's great, but it, it sort of puts people that are going that slow, steady route feeling badly because a friend of theirs suddenly got this really great appointment and they have no experience and they've barely conducted, but they are talented and got this job. And, and then, then the comparisons happen. But the knowledge base is still the most valuable thing, you know, conducting through all the repertoire, having the years of life experience to bring to the podium. I mean, every time you conduct a piece, as you age and you travel the world more, you're going to bring more to it. So you, you don't really want that instant stardom. Because many, many times that doesn't work out for the conductors because they're not necessarily ready for that. So you really want to go for that slower, build that career over time and really establish yourself, I think. But if you get that opportunity at a young age, go ahead and take it. <laughs> Be careful because, you know, once again, it can do more, sometimes damage if you're not ready for it. Yeah, I certainly took some really big gigs that I was not ready for it years ago but i know like it is a really hard thing because i remember seeing some of my friends like you described getting really big things at a young age or even just out of school and then i felt i could have done all of those even though now 10 years later looking back i knew i wouldn't have done a very good job if i had that offer because now i have more experience i know the repertoire better i am a better person with personal skills and all that but that just reminds me of some competitions and even workshops that have age limit. And I feel so sad once I graduated, <laughs> quote, from a lot of programs that some suddenly once I'm 32 or 35 or 40, you're not teachable. You can't even go to workshops to continue improving yourself. I feel just really bad about those ones. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's, you know, particularly for conducting because conducting starts so much later. I mean, if people aren't starting till college, which is, is kind of where a lot of people are starting or later, it is kind of awkward that they have these age restraints for conductors. Yeah, I understand. Sometimes they want to reserve the opportunities for young conductors or conducting students, but people start at different times. Some people start conducting when they're 15, some start at 40. And they are different values to your life experience, your musicianship, and all that you're on your own journey. And it's it's just a hard thing, I think, not just in competition or in workshops, that just mind your own grass, <laughs> as one of my teachers always say. But it's it's a really hard thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. It is. But we can't change the world. We can only change the world a little bit at a time. So. So maybe maybe what, what you need to do is start a competition where there's no age limits and start opening those doors. You know, most workshops now don't have age limits. I think very few have age limits. Did you say there was a competition, I think, during COVID that they it's blind, that they were only judging the conductors based on how the orchestra played? Well, that's interesting. But then they're also judging the quality of the orchestra that they you know, some people had better orchestras. Oh, so, so the, no, 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 it's orchestra. a live, so you come. Got it, got it. The same orchestra, but then you have to make sure the orchestra is doing exactly what the conductor is doing. Right, right, right. That's interesting, interesting. Yeah, because sometimes they ignore you and they just start on autopilot and they sound okay and then you thought you were okay when you were actually not. Right, that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So just kind of to wrap up our conversation, and there's so many great things that you shared and so appreciated. Looking back to your journey being a conductor, a teacher, what are some lessons that you learned? The big lessons, small lessons that you can share with my audience? Yeah, so I think the biggest lesson I learned was the need to be flexible. I think as, as conductors, we're taught to be strong leaders and to have a concept and to have a vision and to have goals. And we are usually type A personalities and we want to move things from here to there. And I think particularly when you're younger, you, you are so vested in that, that sometimes I think young conductors come across as too intense and that we're too young to actually understand and to see an even larger picture 
of how things relate longer term and pick your battles and be much more flexible and trust that the people giving you advice really do know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think when you're younger, you, you say, well, I don't believe what you're saying. You know, you don't say that to them, but in your mind, there's a little, a little devil character or something that's kind of, you know, we think we know everything as young conductors. So I say, you know, don't swim upstream, you, you know, learn to go with the flow a little bit more. I think that's a lesson I learned. And then also the lesson of there are things I wish I would have done where now I, I try to, after concert, really sit down and write what I call my notes for myself of what I learned during that, you know, with that piece. So maybe a section I thought would be a read down section wasn't a read down section. So I make a note of that. Uh, maybe this, maybe this type of DVC didn't work. I make a note of that. Uh, I think it's like last time I did Trike 6, I would have definitely changed the DVC if I were doing that piece again and I had forgotten because I hadn't written it down from the last time. You know, things like everything you learned about the pieces and I wish I would have made that for every piece and kept, you know, a file of every piece and even my diagrams, my an analysis, often it's on a, a piece of paper, but then that piece of paper didn't get filed anywhere. Sometimes it got, sometimes it got put in the front of the score, but sometimes it got separated. So having a, a folder of my analysis of the piece, saving the Boeings for whoever I worked with, so I had filed, so that later on when I do come back, I would have better reminders of what happened the last time I did the piece. Boeings, if whoever I'm doing it with doesn't have Boeings, I have at least some Boeings as a reference right there. And just some information, analysis information, uh, all in one place. Because I, I did it occasionally, but I didn't do it systematically. And so I wish I would have done that. And then the other thing I wish I would have done is to really stay better in touch with people. Because we realize that it's really a much smaller world than we realize when we're starting out. You know, it, it seems like there's so many people. But in essence, if you stay in the field, I always say it's the, the game of last man standing. Because so many people do get out of the field. And so the people that stick around, eventually, you do know them all. And what happens is, is somebody that might be a conductor might eventually be uh, an artistic administrator. Or they might be an executive director or maybe a music agent now is an executive director and or maybe a music publisher that you worked with is now shifting over to be on administrative side and and so really more systematically keeping sort of in touch with people I think is something that I should have done more of I mean we, it's, we all get busy and we can only do so many things in a day but it's something that that I reflect upon that the people you're in school with that are good when you're in school, they're good when they get out and they will be the top players in the field, <laughs> you know, and stay in touch with them all. Yes, I was laughing and taking notes because, as you said, I can be much better and more systematic. I save Boeings at the beginning, but I don't often check what's having changed. Yeah, and then also stay in touch with people. <laughs> I'm real. I'm so bad with that. Yeah, and I'm bad. And then I feel embarrassed. Yeah, I like people, but I just get busy and I just don't do it. And other people I see, they're very, you know, systematic about it. And and the same with the Boeings. I collected Boeing files when I was younger, but then I got so busy, you know, with all the different concerts. So I didn't always track them down because, you know, the concert master's doing them. And, and then even to notating your score where like places where I changed the Boeing specifically because I wanted something very, very specific and just notating that down so you can remember to do that the next time you do it to get that change to the players. Like I do some staggered Boeings in, in Beethoven's Sixth Symphony and that I really like, but making sure that that actually gets into the parts so you're not doing it last minute at a rehearsal. You know, you go, oh yeah, I didn't give the, that Boeing change to someone. So thinking more systematically. Also, another thing is I wish I would have bought the best score at the beginning. Because when, when we're all young and poor, we buy all the Dover scores. So, of course, you know, we own all the Dover scores. But then I'm finding as, as you mature and you have more money, then you're buying Gore-Tex editions and better scores. And, 
and I'm thinking, boy, I'm, I'm actually wasted a lot of money because I had to buy multiple scores. Though I don't mind buying a new score because I love coming at a piece fresh and marking a clean score and seeing what I notice coming at it with a fresh mind again. So actually buying new scores is okay. <laughs> yeah, I have some Dover scores, not so many, but I have a lot of study scores, the mini scores that I can't read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally wish that I had invested and then also the good scores are only getting more expensive yes and so if you buy them earlier you'll save money (laughs) (laughs) yes yes i remember the baron rider when they first came out i was still in college i wasn't even a conducting student and i i made some copies because i was still back in taiwan and i made some illegal copies from the library and then i saved some to get by the miniature score and i regret it i should have bought just the just time. the useful ones but yeah like you know like the one three five <laughs> yeah yeah no, exactly <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and then sometimes i land up rebuying a score because i have a filing system but sometimes i forget to check or sometimes it's filed in the wrong place and then you buy another one you go oh i already own this one <laughs> I know. I have those duplicate scores as well. <laughs> so many of them. And then I have different notes on different ones. And then I felt like I, I didn't want to erase all my bad notes. And then, I don't know, I'm debating if I should buy a, a third one to combine all the notes, but I got so busy. Exactly. Well, and at some point, we should probably just nationally have a, a score donation site where all of us that have duplicate scores that we don't use anymore can donate them and then young conductors can actually apply to get those scores, you know, pass them on. Yeah, that would be great. I actually have, I have my student helping me categorize all the 30 small mini scores to give away. They were from my predecessors. So they were, there were tons of mini scores in my office. I just, so yeah. But whenever you have time to clear out your <laughs> duplicate score, I will take them. Okay. <laughs> But then, thank you so much for coming and thank you for all the things that you shared. I know you teach at multiple workshops every year that people can actually learn from you. But outside from those workshops, where can I find you? Um, your websites? Or, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty easy to find if you know my name and if you can spell my last name correctly. So Diane with one N and then Wittry, W-I-T-T-R-Y dot com. I think I'm the only Diane Wittry in the world that I know of. So if you Google me, you, you will find me. <laughs> but my website is just my name. It's easy to find. And, and on there, there's a contact link. It's dianewitchery at gmail.com. So I'm pretty easy to get to. I like to be findable, actually, because I like to help people. And I like to do things to move the conducting field forward. And Diane is awesome. Whenever you reach out to her, she would get back to you. She is just so generous and so kind. And it's such a pleasure to have you here. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Here you go, my friend. And I hope you love this conversation as much as I did. And actually, Diane is such a generous person. And after I hit the record button, we talked a little bit. I thank her for coming to the show as a guest. And she says some really, really brilliant things that I felt so strongly that my audience need to hear. So I hit the record button again. <laughs> So the beginning of our next conversation is cut a little bit just because I didn't realize that this conversation is going to be so precious. But at the beginning of this conversation, Diane was talking about how she believes each single conductor should have a collection of all the good conducting videos. And she suggested using them for a very specific purpose. And here we go. This is the bonus conversation that we had after we wrapped up our um, interview. The amazing and to actually pull that out so that when they're feeling down, they can look at that and feel really good about themselves. You know, because anytime you look at where you really feel good about your conducting, it gives you energy for going forward. I think we all look at that. But you know, what happens is sometimes when I look back and I thought one workshop I did poorly, there's no footage that I could use after a year or so when I went back 
And I realized it wasn't so bad. There were some good moments or some good ones that I was proud of. I was like, oh, I did all that. It was crappy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember one and I was, I looked and I was like, oh, how did the orchestra follow me? I didn't even know how to, <laughs> how to follow myself. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when people tell me that they don't believe in technique or that technique can't be taught, I just think, you know, that's ridiculous. You no, know, because if the orchestra can't, if you're waving your arm and showing like three impact points, of course the orchestra can't follow you. And that's technique, you know. It's, <laughs> and I can't think of, you know, sports, they, you know, they study that golf swing, you know, batting practice. They study the, the you know, every everything in the world is taught and studied. Why would we think that conductors are any different? Were you ever asked this question? Because we know a lot of famous conductors had bad habits, just like all of us, or they do things that we're told not to do. Yes. You know, like they slouch, they jump around, or they do all those crazy things. One is never done. Like when people say that to you, how do you respond? Well, it's, I mean, great musicians can find a way to communicate. And so obviously they found a way that they could communicate and the orchestra also learned what to ignore. So you no know, orchestras will play be around the conductor. And like with Girgiev, it's his energy. It's not what he does with his hands. He just has a force field of energy that goes out. So you know exactly what he wants, but it's not necessarily his hand. It's his will is there. But since for me, technique did not come easily and I felt that it was my musical ideas were not being played by the orchestra I was getting in my own way I really had to study it to figure out action and reaction and to systematically figure out what I was doing wrong why they weren't exactly together why I couldn't on a dime spin the orchestra to do exactly what I wanted so really, that's all stemmed from my own issues with technique and trying to solve them. And then from teaching where people had absolutely no technique, so they had only a martelet stroke and trying to figure out how to help them work beyond that in a way that didn't totally confuse them. So that's how I came up with it. And I found it works very well and very fast and very quickly people can instantaneously change and do something different and hear the sound in the orchestra instantaneously change. But orchestras are different. I mean, they have similarities, but they all have their personalities and their mentalities. And sometimes when you do the same thing, same gesture, they respond very differently. Also, sometimes it depends on the day. If it's the fifth day of the workshop, they might be really toast or or they coming back from vacation, they are not enthusiastic, like, oh, kind of thing. How do you teach students to be flexible in a way and believe in the, the good technique? Yeah, well, because it is a relationship. And so you basically have to learn that if you give a gesture and the sound that comes back is not what you want, it's stupid to keep giving the same gesture. You have to change immediately the gesture. So if they're not together, it's because I didn't give enough of a prep. I didn't actually hold the sound in my hand before. So I know that next time I give that entrance, I have to conduct that entrance gesture differently. I file that away in my mind. But okay, now I'm conducting and they're too short. It must be that I'm using an ictus beat and I need to use a pendulum beat. So then I need to immediately switch the pendulum beat. So it's responding that whatever they give you back, if it's not what I want, I have to actually immediately change my gesture. And a violinist would do that. You know, if they if they start playing and it's not the sound they want, they would start doing their bow differently. So it, a lot of it is, is in the first three minutes with the orchestra is understanding how that orchestra relates to your gesture. But once again, we're not dealing with one type of gesture. I think that's, the, that's a core problem is that people have been taught in the past by singular teachers who have a singular concept of, you know, the stroke, the beat always happens at the end of the stroke is their concept. And that's a non-forgiving or all beats go through the center. That's another concept of some conductors as opposed to right and left. But there's some music where beats can go in the center and it's great and it should go in the center. And there are other pieces like Firebird where you certainly better show a two and a three or nobody's going to have any idea where you are. So it, once again, it's understanding 
where to apply the techniques. But honestly, conducting technique has not been systematized yet. It's you know, we don't have the Galamians and the hours and, and the people that systematize violin technique. That was all done at, you know, early part of the 1900s. So conducting is now beginning to be analyzed and systematized. But it's a relatively new thing, you know, because before that it was always based upon one teacher's technique. And now that we're kind of able to look at what's happening in, like for me, it was revolutionary to study the Mousson technique because it was so different than anything I've been taught in the United States. It's just opening up the mind to that. But I truly believe that seven, eight of what we do as conductors, the response is subconscious. And so we're really dealing with how do you communicate and get a subconscious response. Okay. So I'm basically saying that if I were to do certain gestures, I could have a people a group of people sitting in front of me that have no musical background and they're still going to be able to respond to my gesture and I will be able to control volume and color of sound and attack all because of, of what I'm showing is very clear and they need need absolutely no musical training. So just a intuitive reaction to the understanding of the motion. Right, exactly. And so it's it's incorporating intuitive reaction and understanding that I can actually show Within a four beat, one beat might be an ictus, one might be a pendulum. You know, they, we, I would use different depending on what I wanted from what the music said. Where, where right now when people, when people study a piece, they just say, oh, this section's in four and oh, do I subdivide or not? You know? Yeah, they are much, much more to the beat pattern and then it's between a beat and what kind of sound that you're getting. That's, it's right. not programmed i felt early enough into a conductor's mind because we're more concerned about tempo and beat and all that and then we felt that's the next step while it should be integrated into right. your beat right it has to be integrated at the beginning and that's why that's why i say in my book it, you know would, wouldn't be wonderful if we could start from a different place and actually start first from the relationship of the gest a gesture to what type of sound that creates and really talk about sound as opposed to beat. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. See, I didn't lie. Diane has a lot of great things to share and she is such a kind and generous person. I have to tell you, I have heard of Diane's name for many, many years, but I didn't get to meet her in person until a couple of years ago. I think it was a year or two before the um, pandemic hit. I went to a workshop in New York, and I went specifically for that event because they say that Diane was going, and then also they focused on some of the business skills that I felt I was lacking back then, you know, about resumes, about interview skills, a lot of things that I, I actually have been sharing on this podcast. But anyhow, Diane came for just a really brief breakfast meeting with all the conductors because, of course, she has such a busy schedule. And after our conversation, I reached out to her by email saying I was so inspired and I wanted to thank her for that conversation. And we kept in touch. I had a few lessons with her. She always had great things to say. And I'm feeling really, really, really honored to have this relationship with her. And also that kind of help and generosity kept me wanting to help anyone else out there interested in knowing more about this conducting profession or wanting to become a conductor. And this is how Girls Who Conduct and also this Conductors podcast all started. And... At the end of today's episode, at the end of our first year of the show, I am going to tell everybody that we are going to pause for a little bit as we conclude the first season of the podcast. I'm going to take a break from recording and interviewing because I have some really busy professional engagements coming up. And also, I wanted to take some time off to reflect, review, and to just think about what's next. And I think this is such an important thing that we take time and review what went well, what didn't go so well, how can we improve ourselves and all that. And of course, this 60-episode 
are full of great gold treasures that I would still love for you to share with your friends and any colleagues that you feel will benefit from listening to us. And I wanted to thank you so much for listening, no matter if it's the first time you're listening or if you've been listening for months, for weeks, for days. It doesn't matter. I hope that I'm bringing some great things to your life, and this is all I have ever wanted. And thank you again. I can't really talk because this is very emotional for me. But I just want to say I'm really honored to be a part of your life and your musical journey. I'm so thankful and so grateful. Take care and bye for now.